The uh, last topic uh, in terms of uh, the treatment of diabetes uh, is the use of uh, insulin. And they started making uh, human insulin uh, beginning in the 1980s. Now, what's become popular at this point is actually not using human insulin now that they learned how to do it, but using insulin analogs. You'd say, what's that? So these are synthetic insulins. They are similar to human insulin, but slightly different. And they vary in the rate at which they're absorbed. In other words, insulin is given by subcutaneous injection. And they've created different kinds of human insulin that are absorbed. Some are absorbed rapidly into the bloodstream, and some are absorbed more slowly. And so that becomes the basis of how we classify different insulins today based upon uh, their uh, onset of action. So um, insulin is sold or made available in these vials. Uh, it is available in, as you probably have seen, in these pens, these injectable pens. Uh, they have insulin pumps, uh, which uh, somebody basically wears, and it's connected internally into the inside of their body, and it gives a continuous release of insulin. That's really uh, the most effective way to do it. Now, uh, the, the basic problem we have with giving insulin is this. When you give insulin, it's going to lower the blood sugar level. That's what insulin does. That's what you, why, why you want to give insulin to somebody who's a diabetic. The problem is, if you give them too much insulin, it lowers their blood sugar level too much, and they can go into a coma from lack of enough sugar in their bloodstream. And it's very difficult to calculate ahead how much insulin they need. You'd say, why? Because the amount of insulin you need, the amount you'd have to inject, depends upon, are you eating a meal? If you're eating a meal, is it a small meal or is it a big meal? Because if they're eating a big meal, they need more insulin. If they're eating just a small meal, they need a small amount of insulin. And if they're not going to be eating at all, they probably need very little insulin. Not only is it affected by when they eat and how much they eat, it's affected by their activity level. If they're going to be taking a hike or playing a little basketball, so then they need more sugar because they're going to use that sugar for their physical activity. If they're going to be sitting and not physically active, then, then they don't need such a high sugar level. So the problem is somebody who has to take insulin has to anticipate ahead what are they going to be doing in terms of both eating and in terms of their physical activity level. And of course, you might say, well, here's my plan for today. I'm going to eat this meal, and then I'm going to be this active. And what happens if things change? For the rest of us, things change all the time. You were planning on having lunch? Oh, I don't have time to eat right now. I'll have to eat lunch later. But for somebody who has to take insulin, they've now changed their plans. Maybe they took too much insulin because they were planning on having lunch, and they don't have time to get lunch, and now their blood sugar level is going to drop too much. Or they were planning on sitting around that day, but instead they're going to have to be physically active, and therefore the amount of sugar they need in their blood changes. So this is what complicates stuff. So we talk about having insulin that uh, is given maybe once a day that s establishes a background level, a, a background or basal level for the blood sugar level. And then they may need additional bolus injections of insulin when they eat a meal that are short lasting. So they typically take a long lasting insulin to give them a baseline level for their blood sugar level, and then they may take additional uh, short-acting insulin uh, when they're about to eat a meal because their blood sugar level is going to uh, go up. So uh, we, uh, one of the more common insulins that's uh, prescribed are, are these rapid onset insulins, uh, especially when somebody just needs a bolus injection when they're going to eat a meal. And an example is Humalog or Lispro insulin. That's the one that's right here. And you'll notice that, in fact, it actually says insulin Lispro. And this, uh, this has a uh, rapid onset of action. Uh, it starts to work in 10 minutes after giving a subcutaneous injection. And it only lasts for about four hours. So that's a really short-lasting insulin. This is also the type of insulin used in insulin pumps, which have a continuous release of insulin uh, all the time. If you look on the next page, S10, 
So what these pictures show is there are different kinds of synthetic insulin today that have different onset of actions and different durations of action. This is indicating their uh, insulin effect, the insulin effect. So you'll notice this is a very sh rapid at onset, short duration of action insulin. Uh, here is a, a relatively short acting. This is an intermediate acting, so it's, there's a delay in the onset of action, but it has a longer duration of action. So they have all these variations of different types of insulin, and they can even combine them. They can combine a long duration insulin with a short, rapid onset, short duration insulin so that they can try to adjust for that person's need. So the point that I guess I'm trying to make is there's not one single insulin, there are many types of insulin. And it really has to be adjusted individually for that person and their lifestyle and their particular body needs and so on. If you uh, look on page uh, S11, on S11, so there is uh, our insulin, regular insulin, uh, which has a, an onset of action of 30 minutes and a duration of action of eight hours. There's the intermediate insulins, uh, where onset of action takes an hour before you start to see any effect in lowering the blood sugar level, but it has a 12-hour duration of action. You have very long-acting insulins that uh, have a duration of action for 24 hours. So there are all these variations uh, in the uh, types of uh, insulins. On the next page on S12, they have also these premixed combinations of insulin where they combine, as I just said, a long duration of action with a short duration uh, of action insulin. Okay, now what's the major adverse effect of insulin? No matter which type of insulin you were talking about, the major serious harmful effect is if you take an overdose. As I just said, if somebody took too much insulin relative to the, what their needs are at their moment, their blood sugar level will drop too much, and this is serious. You'd say, why is it serious? Because your brain cells run only on sugar. And if you drop that sugar level in the bloodstream too low, brain cells will die. All right, so that's pretty, pretty damn serious. So that's called insulin shock. And that can happen if somebody took their dose of insulin and wasn't able to eat, or they didn't eat the, what, the amount that they had thought they were going to eat, or they be, were more physically active than they had planned, and uh, therefore used up that sugar in their bloodstream at a faster rate. So uh, I think that the bottom line for you is this. If you're dealing with a patient who has to inject insulin, you need to have sh uh, candy available because they may collapse, they may faint right in front of you. That's because their blood sugar level dropped too much and you want to give them some sugar. Now interestingly, they can also collapse if their blood sugar level is too high. So if they collapse, you don't really know whether their blood sugar level has gone too low or too high. But we assume that if, if it's too low, giving them sugar will help. And if it's too high, giving them more sugar isn't going to make it any worse than it already is. So if, since you don't know, you give sugar. Uh, insulin will have an increased effect. You'll get increased effect of uh, insulin if the patient is on a beta blocker or some adrenergic blocker. You may say, what does that mean? Beta blockers block the sympathetic response. They block the effect of adrenaline. What does adrenaline do to your blood sugar level? It raises it. So if you're on a sympatholytic, an adrenergic blocker, it prevents the blood sugar level from going up due to epinephrine. So in other words, when somebody's on an adrenergic blocker, a sympatholytic drug, their blood sugar levels are going to be lower than normal. Insulin makes the blood sugar lower. So the two together may lower it too much. So you have to be cautious about that. Uh, there are other drugs that also tend to lower the blood sugar level. But the most important would be the adrenergic blockers, which are commonly used for cardiovascular problems, including angina pectoris and high blood pressure. You'll get an, a decreased effect with insulin if they're on a corticosteroid like prednisone. 
Do you remember prednisone and the other glucocorticosteroids raise the blood sugar level? So if somebody's taking a corticosteroid like prednisone, that tends to raise the blood sugar up, so that, that means they may need more insulin than normal. Thyroxin. Now, thyroxin, thyroxin hormone is very similar to epinephrine in its actions. If epinephrine speeds up the heart rate and increases metabolic rate, so, so does thyroxin. So anybody who is hyperthyroid, it, they tend to have elevated blood sugar levels. And if they have hypothyroidism, they tend to have slow metabolic rate and low blood sugar levels. Thyroid problems are really common. It's very important you understand that uh, people who have hyperthyroidism, it's similar to having too much adrenaline. And people who have hypothyroidism, it's similar to them not having enough adrenaline. There are a lot of similarities between the actions of adrenaline and the actions of thyroxine. Both uh, speed up metabolic rate, both raise the blood sugar level. Uh, as far as clinical considerations, it is suggested that diabetic patients schedule their appointments in the morning, after breakfast, and after taking their medication. So presumably their blood sugar level is okay. You don't want to see somebody later in the day where they may be having low blood sugar levels and they may collapse on you. When you have a patient who identifies themselves on the medical history that they are diabetic, ask when did they last eat? Because again, if they haven't eaten in a while, it's not going to hurt for them to have a piece of candy or something, uh, just to make sure that their blood sugar level doesn't drop too much. The last thing I wanted to mention, is what is metabolic syndrome? So there's an increasing awareness that there is a, that people with high blood pressure which is very common, and people with diabetes, which is quite common, have similar problems. The bottom line is this. You got to eat right. You should be reducing your intake of carbs and fats because in excessive intake of carbs and fats, especially as one grows older, increases the risk of both diabetes and developing atherosclerosis and high blood pressure. You have to uh, get enough exercise. Uh, aerobic exercise, or let's put it this way, a lack of aerobic exercise of that physical activity, especially as one grows older, also increases the risk of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and uh, cardiovascular disease, including high blood pressure. So it is very common when you see people who are not eating right, who are not exercising right, develop both. They develop both cardiovascular problems and diabetes both and they feed into each other. Each one makes the other worse. This has uh, become known as metabolic syndrome. And what we're starting to see is this problem at a younger and younger age. We're starting to see teenagers with metabolic syndrome who are already showing pre-diabetes states and uh, their borderline high blood pressure. And they're getting it at way too young of an age.